As soon as we reach 200, we'll start, so we're getting we there. Are you okay, Marty? Doing your gastroc stretches? <laughs> I am. <laughs> I have really bad plantar fasciitis that I've had since January, yeah. and I'm hobbling all over the place. I just, it's terrible. Most of us, shall we? Yes, please. Okay, I'm gonna start. Okay, go ahead. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, uh, um, good afternoon, uh, those who lived in uh, the Western uh, part of the world, and uh, good evening, uh, those who live in the Middle East, and probably good morning to those who live in the Eastern part of the world. Um, it's an honor to, uh, for the Saudi Pediatric Urology to uh, uh, have this uh, webinar, and uh, it is our pleasure to have uh, a distinguished uh, panelist who uh, have humbly uh, uh, agreed to uh, participate and uh, join us uh, for this uh, meeting. Um, uh, our panelists, um, we have three panelists. Um, uh, it's, uh, our honor and a great thanks to them to, uh, to be here. Um, uh, Martin Coyle is, is um, uh, the chief of pediatric urology and uh, at the hospital for sick children in, in Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, he was uh, previously division chief at Seattle Children's Hospital uh, at the University of uh, Washington in Seattle. Uh, um, he uh, has been known for his many innovations and uh, contributions, especially to the field of pediatric urology and transplantation, as well as leadership and quality improvement and patient safety. Uh, welcome, uh, Martin. Uh, our uh, second uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Caldemon. He is the director of uh, pediatric uh, urology at Pro Children Hospital and professor of uh, urology and pediatrics. Um, uh, he has uh, um, uh, and, uh, uh, Anthony has served as the president of the New England uh, section of the American Urology Association and also served as the secretary treasurer of the president and the president of the Society of Pediatric Urology. He is uh, currently uh, the uh, chairman of Pediatric Subspeciality Certification Examination Committee and an executive secretary of the Pediatric Urology Advisory Council. In 2012, Caldemon uh, was uh, received of the University of Rochester uh, Humanitarian Award. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Anthony. Thank, thank you for having me. Okay, uh, uh, our third uh, distinguished uh, panelist is Dr. Andrew Kirsch. Uh, he's professor uh, and chief of pediatric urology at uh, Emory uh, University School of Medicine and the chief of pediatric urology at Scottish, uh, Scottish Rite and the director of pediatric robotic surgery, children's health care of Atlanta, and also the chief of pediatric urology, Georgia uh, Urology. He was ranked as the top 10 in, in US News and World uh, Report and has written uh, extensively in the field of uh, pediatric urology with emphasis on GUR, cryptorchidism, and MRI, and has published over 200 journal articles and book chapters. So welcome all, and welcome all participants and attendees. Uh, and uh, we can start just a quick note. Um, Please, uh, anyone who has a question, please uh, write it in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of the screen, and uh, we will be uh, happy to uh, display your question to the panelists, and hopefully uh, we will have a successful meeting. Fahad, you can start. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. It's good to have uh, Dr. Marty, uh, 
uh, Andy and Tony in this uh, great, uh, we hope it will be a great session. Uh, the setup here, we did make it interactive, taste-based. We thought it's better than lecture setting where uh, it's hard to come up with uh, good judgment without seeing real cases. So uh, we have four cases. Uh, we chose different uh, uh, scenarios that we face in a day-to-day -day practice in, uh, uh, in our daily practice. So our, uh, just before we start, I'm gonna get a quick introduction that high-grade VR, we chose this tip topic specifically because this is something we think we know a lot, but actually reality is when you have a patient in your practice, after you tell them that you're gonna operate or you're gonna observe, Every time I see a patient, after they leave the room, I say, did I do the right thing or not? There, is, there isn't too many answers that we know. And we think we know reflux very well. But for those patients who are asymptomatic, boys or girls, are we making the right decision? Then we come back to the old literature say that high-grade reflux is a bad disease. It comes with recurrent UTIs, renal scarring, chronic kidney disease. Uh, so are, are these info that we inherited still uh, valid or not. And we thought that having symptomatic VOR in this discussion, it's, it's less controversial. So we know that we have to intervene. So then we start with, how do we certify our patient? And we'll come, we're gonna come through that in our presentation. And the last thing we'll talk about is the VOR and chronic disease. Is it association relationship or causation relationship? And can we use one size fits all approach for these patients or not? Hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll have some answers or all the answers, I hope, uh, for, for these questions. So to start uh, our first case, uh, we have a newborn boy who's uh, born with the left moderate antenatal uh, hydronephrosis. He was started on cab by his pediatrician. Postnatally, this is his ultrasound. And as you can see, there is a grade three to four uh, hydro on the left side, minimal to no uh, hydro on the right side and bladder looked normal. At this point, the pediatrician ordered the VCUG. This is his initial VCUG showing right grade four, left grade five VUR, normal looking bladder and urethra. So at this point, he was referred, uh, did see the urologist in the first month of life, continued in cab, circumcision was recommended and done, and DMSA was planned. And this is another controversial topic. Do we have to do DMSA or not? But it's not the uh, topic of our discussion today. So the first question to uh, our panelists, how can you risk stratify, uh, we'll start with uh, Marty Coyle, uh, how can you stratify your patients, especially high grade reflux? So this is a patient that's picked up uh, serendipitously and we're assuming that uh, the pregnancy went well with normal amniotic fluid, no respiratory distress, an otherwise yes. healthy child. Uh, yeah. So what I do is, is, is I think that it's very important that today in 2020 that we, we define and understand what informed consent is and relate that in the context of who the patient is. Is it a bright family? Is it a family that is close to medical care? So we can't just, one of the questions you asked earlier is does one size fits all? And the answer is no, we're in, a, we're in a, a new stage of medicine that's individualized, personalized medicine. So do I stratify patients? I do based more on sex than I do on anything else. The fact that this is a male, it's very likely that with high grade reflux, even with a normal ultrasound, that there may some, be some degree of dysplasia. The other thing is unlike a uh, patient born later in life who has had a UTI, the newborns who were found by screening, such as in this case, there, there is a, a likelihood for this to get better. It may not go away, but it may get better over time. So at least in my hands, I offer the family circumcision or prophylaxis um, uh, because it was picked up serendipitously. They may elect both of them. They may elect neither of them but that's their decision. Okay. Uh, Andy, would you uh, approach this differently? Yeah, I would agree with uh, comments made by Marty. Um, you know, this is a patient who uh, is likely going to have uh, a high degree of renal dysplasia. 
Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the kidney function is significantly impaired, especially on that left side. Uh, and there's basically two main questions. Is this re reflux going to resolve? And second, does it matter? Uh, and so that those two questions will uh, form the basis for, for um, determining um, how to select patients for treatment. And I think as you, you mentioned, it would be a whole lot easier if this patient had recurrent febrile urinary tract infections to make that decision. Um, so in the absence of recurrent infections and seeing that this DMSA scan that you put up here, uh, showing that there's scarring in the left kidney with impaired function, um, you, know, you have to look at that. Is that like, that's a congenital uh, issue. Uh, this is developmental. Uh, and so far there's no reason to intervene on this reflux. And in terms of when would you consider it, uh, certainly the first year of life um, is a time to observe. Uh, in the absence of a clinical reason to intervene. Uh, this is a patient that would be put on antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, I think circumcision is a reasonable choice. Um, Graham Smith from Australia has shown, you know, clearly that circumcision in a patient with high-grade reflux is probably better to prevent UTIs than fixing their reflux. Um, and so we would typically repeat studies uh, in about a year. And then finally, I would say, you know, in, in patients who are asymptomatic, you know, what is the effect of high-grade reflux on bladder development? Uh, Ula Sillen's uh, decade of work um, has really shown us that you could predict patients who will eventually develop bladder dysfunction uh, based on their first year's um, appearance of their bladder in neurodynamic studies. Um, so this patient's bladder looks fairly normal to me. Uh, it doesn't look like it's uh, enlarged um, significantly. Um, so this is a patient that I would observe. Okay, great. Uh, Tony, uh, would you have another any different approach? N not much different overall. Just a couple of points that I just want to uh, uh, emphasize. Um, because of the status of upper tracts, even though this is not acquired upper tract damage, it does put them into a higher risk category because the status of the upper tract is somewhat predictive of the resolution rate of the reflux, but more importantly, the risk of breakthrough urinary tract infections. And there certainly have been multiple studies to show that. And therefore, I, he is in a high risk category. It would push me towards antibiotic prophylaxis uh, for this boy. Whether he's circumcised or not doesn't matter so much to me. I would advocate that he be circumcised, but if the family decided they would rather not have him circumcised, I wouldn't have a problem with that. And it wouldn't change my plan if he's circumcised or not as to whether he's on antibiotics or not. I think when you risk stratify a patient like this, there are multiple factors that you need to take into account besides just the grade of reflux alone. Certainly, we used to have almost a knee-jerk reaction to treating reflux based on the grade when I was in training. But that has changed significantly. And as I mentioned, the status of the upper tracts, how the patient presents, whether they present with infections or hydronephrosis, um, whether or not the family can, can is risk tolerant, I think is an important factor in your management yeah. of these patients. So, so in summary, I would say because he's a high risk patient, I would place him on prophylaxis initially and, uh, and watch this child very closely. And it wouldn't matter to me whether he's circumcised or not, if he's not having urinary tract infections. Okay, how would you follow on Tony? What's your follow up protocol? Knowing that there is no uh, one guidelines that people follow, there yeah. is subjectivity there. So how would you follow this patient? Sure, sure. Um, a good question for Had. I probably would say, that in the absence of any urinary tract infections and he's doing well on prophylaxis, I may re-ultrasound him in about a year, consider repeating his VCUG at about two years if his ultrasound looks like he's having renal growth without any increase in his hydronephrosis. Cool. Marty and Andy, would you repeat his VCUG at any point if he stays asymptomatic? So it's interesting, when Tony and I were in training, these patients were followed every three months with urinalyses. Uh, uh, or urine cultures, excuse me, and then at a year of age would have a re repeat VCUG. Um, uh, uh, and some did them more frequently, but I'm with Tony, I would keep him on prophylaxis for the year but, and repeat the ultrasound in one year just as a baseline. At that time, 
I stop the antibiotics unless the family says we would like to know the reflux is still there. In which case, I tell them I'd like to wait another year uh, uh, and I keep them on just like Tony until they're two and repeat the BCUG. So I give them the option. Did you repeat the BCUG at all? And so I, uh, so I don't, I tell them that I'm, your child has never had a urinary tract infection. My bet is if we repeat the DMSA, especially that left kidney, you'll see re further reduction in function. So that's, again, everything has to be discussed with them, but I would not repeat the BCUG and in, in, if it were my own child, I'd stop the antibiotics at one year and, uh, get, and essentially it's a stress test to see how the child did. But that doesn't mean that it's, uh, I don't offer different options to the family. Great, and you would repeat his BCUG. Yeah, I think if I made the decision to put this patient on antibiotic prophylaxis, um, I think it would be reasonable to do a VCUG in follow-up to give them a sense of whether or not we're still considering it or not considering it. Uh, and I think nothing uh, more um, uh, appropriate is shared decision-making, especially for reflux. And so Marty's points about that at the beginning and what he just said are very important. Um, I, I don't think you'll have any trouble finding uh, a group of pediatric urologists that would operate on this patient within the first year of life, um, just based on looking at a DMSA and a VCUG. Uh, but you know, the question is, is that the right decision? And if we try to make our decisions based on uh, you know, clinical issues or potential for clinical issues, um, that's where you know, intervention uh, becomes most appropriate. Uh, so I think following them in a year on antibiotic prophylaxis with the VCG and probably just an ultrasound, I'm not sure I would even repeat the, uh, the DMSA scan. Excellent. So just to uh, summarize this DMSA showing function of 24 on the left side, 75 on the right, with no clear scarring, it's mainly dysplasia. So moving forward, now he's two years of age, he's still in cap, no UTIs, uh, not toilet trained yet, Repeated VCUG is done, and as you can see that the right reflux resolved, left reflux still there, grade 5, the urethra and bladder looks normal, and bladder looks good size bladder coming back to uh, uh, Andy points. The bladder still look good shape and good size. Uh, so follow-up DMSA was done at that point. Uh, function 20%, which is kind of close to the previous. Left side 80% and no clear scarring. So basically, same Thing that we were seeing whenever he was younger, so no big changes except that the right side resolved. So in summary, this is a two years old boy, asymptomatic, left grade five VUR, right grade four VUR that already resolved, reduced function of the left kidney. So we'll have a panel, uh, we'll have a poll uh, for the audience here to see what would they do for this kid. We'll take a minute for that uh, uh, for them to answer. Then we'll discuss before we see what approach with the panelists will do at this point. For, for Hog, did you just go back to the last slide of the DMSA? I think the numbers are flipped. The left is twenty. It was twenty-four. Yeah. So uh, yes, yes, you're right. You're right. Yes. Okay. Just That's so we're clear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The left is twenty. It was twenty-four, and the right yes. is uh, okay. eighty. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. No so problem. we'll start the poll. We'll have a minute for the audience to answer, then we'll uh, show the, uh, uh, the results. One sixty-eight out of two seventy-one. Bahad, I'm also seeing that people are asking questions on the chat instead of the Q and A. Yeah, yeah. So you uh, might want to remind them to uh, put it on the Q and A rather than yeah. chat. Please, yeah. we have, uh, if any of the audience have questions, they can put them in the question and answer part, not the chat. I think we already deactivated the chat part, but these are old questions in the beginning. Thank you. 
So do, do you want to uh, have the questions at the end of each case or uh, shall we? Yeah. 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 I think, uh, yeah. And we can, we can clear them. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Yeah. So uh, as we see that observation with cap 33%. So basically even number for observation with cap or without 28 and 33. 24% uh, would reimplant and 14% would do endoscopic. Uh, so going back to our uh, panelists, uh, what would be your approach? We'll start with uh, Tony here. So what would be your approach to this patient with the current situation? Um, this may sound like I'm, I'm avoiding the question, but I'm not. The fact <laughs> is, is that there are a lot of, there are a few other factors that I'm not sure how would, it would all weigh into this. And the most important is what the family's tolerance is of this situation. If it was a family, for instance, that was transient, uh, maybe uh, moving to a situation where they would not have reasonably good care, I'd recommend correcting the reflux, quite honestly. If it's a family who lives locally, who clearly understands the situation and the risks and knows what the warning signs are if this boy gets in trouble, I would feel most comfortable with keeping him off prophylaxis and watching him because I don't think there's anything I could do to correct his reflux that would improve his situation that he has right now, quite honestly, whether it's open surgery or it's endoscopic correction. So I'd, I would stop his in, in that scenario with a tolerant family, with a compliant family, with a family that has access to care, good medical care, good pediatric urological care, I might say, I would observe him with uh, off prophylaxis is the bottom line. When would you stop his prophylaxis at this I point? Probably, I probably would have stopped it at about a year of age if the family was okay with it. Okay, and I think Marty said uh, already that he would stop at one year, but you would still observe Marty, right? Well, but this family has already elected to have another VCUG, so you've changed the scenario. So I wouldn't have done the VCUG. No, but it's no. done. So at this point, what would you do? So again, I, I reassure them that it, it's helpful to see that uh, there has been some improvement. Does it mean that he really doesn't have reflux on the right side? We don't know. The fact that he's got a good renal unit, unit makes it much more likely that it has. Uh, so I would uh, again sit down with them. As, as Tony said, risk tolerance is the issue here. Education and, and understanding the families. Uh, comprehension and their ability to have good follow-up is the key. Uh, uh, so still, uh, my pr primary thing would be to see how they do off antibiotics. Okay, great. Andy? Would yeah, you I would involve uh, in nephrology uh, in this case for long-term follow-up. I think they will check this patient for proteinuria, hypertension. Um, I don't think surgery is going to change this patient's outlook. Uh, but as the other speakers have said already, there are other factors. Um, the conversation I have uh, with families regarding stopping antibiotics versus surgery um, sometimes will center around aggressive observation, which means they don't come back and see me and they don't get a VCUG or any other study. But in, in a case like this where you already have renal dysplasia, and, and I would say this is an at-risk patient, uh, long-term, that they need to have so, a doctor following them. And I think the nephrologists are best served to, to follow these patients. If the family wanted something done surgically, I would look at open surgery as perhaps having a better success rate, but also a higher morbidity and higher risk for creating obstruction. Um, and so endoscopic injection, even though I personally don't like to use it in the highest grades of reflux, um, I think it's a decent alternative to something that might have a higher morbidity. And would you have stopped the cap? Or you would, because the classic teaching that we know that at age of toilet training. So would you stop it or would uh, you go with Marty and... Uh, you know, I typically, I, I typically look at when the risk of infection seems to drop. And in boys that are, are, are uncircumcised, they typically drop after one year. Uh, this patient has been circumcised, so I feel very comfortable stopping at one year. Great. If I could add one thing, Farhad, I did see someone say that they would 
choose to reimplant the left side. I think if you decide to do a reimplant for this child, I'd vote to correct both sides, not just the left side, as there's about a close to 40% chance that there would be postoperative reflux on the right side if you just corrected the left. So that's one thing I definitely would not do, and that is just correct the left side if we moved into the direction of a reimplantation. Yep, great. So uh, if you chose to observe his PR persists that he's at five years of age now, uh, Question, would you repeat his VCUG? I think we know Marty answered. He would have not done even the second one. But Tony and Andy, would you have repeated his VCUG at this point? Knowing, because question comes here, bladder cycling, age of void and dysfunction. He already have reduced function in one side. Uh, so uh, Andy, would you have repeated his VCUG at this point? He's five and... Not, I think after toilet training, I certainly wouldn't if he wasn't having problems with infections or, or incontinence. Um, I, probably would have followed him with an ultrasound to look at growth of the kidneys. With that said, I think if a DMSA showed that the kidney function was starting to drop, I would look at that like that was a problem with growth of the better kidney, not further injury from uh, non-infectious reflux, because that has been shown not to uh, cause uh, uh, injury to the kidney. And we've known that for a long time. Um, so I wouldn't uh, repeat a BCUG at this point. I would do aggressive uh, observation. Okay. Uh, Tony, would you have repeated the VCUG? I think I kind of feel that you worried about that reduced function side, but now at this age, avoidance function and the theory of poor bladder, poor, poor bladder cycling, would you repeat his VCUG at this point? If he toilet trained normally uh, and without any issues and he's not had any UTIs off prophylaxis, I would not repeat his VCUG. I don't think that would the results of that BCG would change my management in any way. Yeah, great. So I think we chose the case uh, in a way that it gets more complicated. So it's kind of makes sense what we're saying, but we'll, things will change for the audience, will change uh, in the next few cases. So endoscopic correction was done for this patient at uh, age of five years. This is his VCUG, uh, we showed no more reflux, and he was just followed, uh, no, no UTIs. Uh, before we move to the next case, Mustafa, uh, yeah, Vinny, you want to add one or two questions before we move forward from the audience? Yeah, I have 26 questions, but we'll try to uh, answer the most important one. Uh, this is one thing. The second, uh, for, for all the participants, please, um, we will allow, uh, I see some uh, participants have raised their hands to uh, participate, but because of the shortage of time, uh, we will allow probably at the end, if, if time allows to, to, uh, to, uh, for you to participate. So uh, the first question is, is, is the reflux a disease or a phenomena? I think we will come to this later. So we will keep this question to the end. Uh, the second question, uh, in case you decided to do DMSA, uh, both natally, which one, which month you would prefer, the first, the third, or the sixth month? So, uh, is there any any preference from your side? So, DMSA, unlike Mag three, you could do it any time. There's no difference. It has no. It, uh, it it binds to the proximal convoluted tubule. So, it, it, uh, it there's not a timing issue. Whereas, if you're looking at something that's excreted. You're, you're dealing with transitional nephrology. So uh, if you were concerned about obstruction, you would do a MAG-3, unless you're very concerned, uh, around six weeks to, to three months of age. But a DMSA, you can do it any time. It's the same validity. Okay. Tony, um, Andy, any comment? I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I would say that I tend to try and convince families to go ahead with a DMSA in terms of uh, patients who have high-grade reflux, though, because I think that does help me uh, in terms of risk gratification and potential management options. Okay. Um, yes, Andy, you agree. Okay. So uh, another question, is there a rule for uh, ultrasound spine in such cases? Probably, I don't know rule out neurogenic cause of this. Do you see any any uh, indication to do ultrasound of the spine if his spine is normal? 
Andy? Yeah, so I think in the absence of a, a physical finding, um, I would not do an ultrasound. I think uh, if you look, again, if you look back at uh, Ulla Sillin's data from Sweden, uh, if you look at the appearance of the bladder in the first year of life um, in normal subjects versus those with high grade reflux, you can't see uh, any difference. They will still have the stigmata uh, of, a, of somebody who's got uh, discoordination between their bladder contractions and external sphincter. After, after one year, things change. But there's nothing really to indicate in this patient that you would need to be concerned about a neurologic issue. Okay. Um, I would agree. Okay. Me too. Um, sure. Um, another sure. question. Uh, shall we move? One more question. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm just choosing the... Uh, there is a, a question of... Uh, would you ensure dysplasia by a biopsy, Marty? No. Tony? No, no need. I don't think that information would uh, change our management, no. And Andy. I think the pathologist would probably like to know, but I don't think it would help me. Okay. Maybe if the patient was hypertensive without reflux. Okay. okay. Can we move ahead because of the time? If time is, I think most of the questions will come because we've uh, covered yeah. different uh, areas of reflux in the presentation. So moving forward, our second case is uh, changing the themes now, eight years old girl, diagnosed earlier in life uh, with bilateral high grade VUR. She lost follow up and now she came back to us uh, at age of eight. Uh, she's not in cab, no UTIs, no avoidance function, no constipation, asymptomatic whatsoever. Uh, her GP did her workup before he referred her. So this is her ultrasound uh, showing right grade one hydro, left no hydro, bladder looks normal, no thick wall, no debris, with dilated right distal ureter. He did, his, uh, he did the VCUG before uh, he referred her, uh, referred her to us. As you can see, there is bilateral grade three VUR, bladder looks normal, and there is spinning top urethra and avoiding films, uh, but she is completely asymptomatic. She's not constipated and uh, asymptomatic. DMSA was done also by her GP, showing that the function almost equal 54 on the right, uh, 45 on the left, and no scarring. And the reason for the DMSA, uh, if some ask, because this patient have lost follow-up and uh, her GP wanted to make sure that uh, she didn't have any febrile UTI or scarring secondary to that. But Apparently, it looks normal, and it did not change much in this case. So in summary, this is an eight years old pre pubertal girl, asymptomatic, bilateral grade three VR with no evidence of scarring. Uh, we'll take a poll for the audience here before we move forward. Uh, what would you, what you would be your preferred approach for this patient? And actually, the panelists can vote too. I don't think it lets uh, us vote. Can you see it now? Oh yeah, it does let us vote. <laughs> nice interruption, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Seventy nine percent voted. I'll wait for the one minute mark and uh, st stop it. Okay. So, 81%. So, 64% uh, would have observed, 30% uh, would do endoscopic correction, and 6% uh, will do ureteric reimplantation. Great. So, uh, moving forward. So, for the panelists, uh, we'll start with uh, Marty. Where do you place grade 3 VUR? Is it high grade or low grade? 
because it's somewhere in between. Because when we talk about high grade, it's always grade four and five, one and two is low grade. So where do you place grade three? Well, like you said, Fahad, I put it right in the middle. It's uh, a teeter-totter or a, a swing where everything is balanced. Um, I, I don't think it's important to call it high or low in this situation with, because it, uh, I think what makes it important, as Tony talked about in the last case, is what's the function of the kidneys. And these kidneys don't have scarring. So I don't like looking at, at the grade out of context as to uh, what the what the renal units are doing. So in this case, I would I would it doesn't matter what the grade is. It's lower grade to me or lower risk. Okay, so uh, Tony, would the spinning top urethra uh, part change your so first what what would you do yeah. for this patient? Let me, let me let me go back to Marty's point because I, I don't think that can be overly emphasized quite honestly. The fact is, is that you can have a grade one or a grade two, in my mind, that's a high risk patient. And you can have a grade five that's a low risk patient, as far as reflux is concerned. So I think the importance is, is not to think in terms of high grade reflux and low grade reflux, but think in terms of the big, bigger picture and what the risk is. Now, to get to your question about the significance of the spinning top urethra, in the absence of any symptomatology that would indicate lower tract voiding dysfunction, I would completely dismiss it. And the reason is, is that her bladder looks normal. I'll presume that she emptied her bladder okay on the VCG, but we don't have those films necessarily. But let's say she did. Um, and she's asymptomatic as far as her voiding is concerned. Um, I think this is just an aberration on the, uh, on the radiograph, quite honestly, and maybe just a function of having been catheterized and a um, and bit of a tight sphincter uh, when she's voiding, but certainly not clinically significant in my mind. Okay, so Tony, just to follow up to what you've said. So this patient is eight now. She had lost follow-up. Uh, would compliance be part of uh, the pieces that you use to make your uh, decision for this patient. It's basically I'm saying, what's your preferred approach, knowing that this family had history of poor compliance at some point that she lost right. follow-up for about six years. Right. So would that yeah. change your management? Yeah. First, what would you do? And that would, that, that, would worry me. that would worry me a lot. I think I'd have to have that very serious conversation with the family and understand the circumstances of what appears to be a poorly compliant family. And if the circumstances were such that there were things beyond their control, such as uh, moving away because of a military obligation or something along those lines, but otherwise a very understanding and compliant family, I wouldn't be too concerned about that scenario necessarily. But if this is a family who clearly is not listening, not understanding, not, not appreciating the potential gravity of the situation, then I'd probably lean towards a conversation that might consider correcting her reflux, quite honestly, even though I would normally, I would otherwise probably place her in a low risk category. Okay, uh, Andy, would, uh, what you would be your preferred approach for this patient? So yeah, I agree with what uh, Tony said. I guess you could say on the other hand, she's eight, her treatment by being non-compliant has been observation and she passed it. Uh, so I think she's already shown us that she is not a high risk patient during sexual activity, pregnancy, perhaps her risk will go up, uh, but we're not looking at somebody who's at high risk for hypertension or renal failure. Uh, so I think you have a little more wiggle room in somebody like this to continue to do nothing. Um, another question that you, I don't think you had in this survey was whether or not people would put this patient on antibiotic prophylaxis now that you have them back in the office. And um, that ex this exact question came up in the New England Journal of Medicine several years ago. They took a girl that was six that had, had been non-compliant for the last four years with bilateral grade three and asked, would you do observation, antibiotics, or surgery? Um, and um, the, the river trial was supposed to answer that question because it was going to look at observation versus antibiotics. Well, it turns out that um, the, the uh, experts at that time said that you should put the patient on antibiotics because the river trial would prove them right. The survey of a thousand people around the world about what to do about that patient and this patient was either you do nothing or you do surgery. 
um, that antibody prophylaxis really had no role at this age and this time. Um, so I think you can make a case for the future risk by doing a little something and a little something uh, in my practice would be endoscopic treatment because it has very little morbidity and a high success rate. And it's maybe better than doing antibiotic prophylaxis, but you're competing with doing nothing in this case, uh, as Tony pointed out. Great, Marty, what would be your approach to this patient? So I would observe, but I, I think the real key is this patient has no bowel bladder dysfunction. And my worry um, uh, is that males tend to have urinary tract infections in the first year of life, which is uh, diminished by doing circumcision. It then stays flat till our prostates start to grow. Women, on the other hand, have a curve that continuously go up, goes up, but with certain blips. Potty training, it has a rapid rise. Puberty, it goes up with another blip. Sexual activity, another blip. And menopause with another blip. So the one thing that's very important with this uh, patient is to understand that she may at uh, be at risk throughout her life if she develops urinary tract infection of developing polynephritis. So she has to be educated to know what the symptoms of a UTR are because she's never had one in order to try to prevent polynephritis. So it's education is the key. Great, so Marty, just we're trying uh, this presentation or uh, webinar to cover areas that we think we've known. So classically, even in Campbell or uh, classic teaching that we tell our residents that reflux after age of six, girls, we have to treat. So knowing that this came from the era of uh, access to care was not the best, poor hygiene, antibiotics were not potent. So I think we've already answered, but I want to make sure that people leave with this message. So are we still treating girls differently if they're symptomatic and they reach the age of six? Well, I think we're, we're treating everybody differently because of not only of uh, the natural history, we're understanding more about it. A lot of the things that we accepted as dogma beforehand in our training are now being shown to be false. So we'll get to that, I think, with some of the other cases. And I I want to make sure we get there before talking about it. Okay, so I think we have uh, an agreement between the panelists and no one would have operated for this patient at this point, unless uh, she's poor compliant in the family, you cannot trust the family of a follow-up. So Marty, just before we move forward, uh, Marty uh, thankfully shared with me a great paper, which I will share with the audience at the end, and which basically dividing the patients into males and females and basically saying, the male uh, patient with reflux does have the disease where the females have the symptoms. The disease, which is basically the dysplasia with the high, higher grade. Uh, can you shed the light on this, Marty, and uh, give us your perspective of how boys are different than girls? So again, if you look at the transplant literature, the, the number who get, re who get a transplant for reflux historically has been almost all males and those are likely the boys who are born with dysplasia, who had grade four to five reflux and renal insufficiency to begin with. The group that I worry about is because I don't know if, how much we change the natural, natural, sorry, the natural history of that group unless they do have UTIs. And that is a high risk pa patient group which needs to be followed very, very closely if you're not intervening because we don't have the answers. Girls, on the other hand, rarely have high-grade reflux, as was shown in the study, uh, but they tend to have more bowel bl bladder dysfunction as time goes on, and their risk of UTIs becomes greater. And as a result, I'm not sure if the reflux is truly primary reflux, or is it always secondary, or most often secondary reflux in, in females related to uh, uh, dysfunctional elimination. Great, perfect. Andy, Tony, anything to add on this point? Yeah, I would just uh, also just say that um, nothing's 100%, right? Um, we've always kind of associated reflux in girls with some degree of bowel bladder dysfunction. I think there's a subset of patients, and I bet you it's a pretty small subset, 
but I think reflux contributes to their bowel and bladder dysfunction. And this has been shown by Jorn Lacrin's group in Sweden. It's been shown in the uh, Italian group, and we've also shown it, that girls that have urgency incontinence and reflux, um, when you are kind of forced to do something because of recurrent breakthrough urinary tract infections, we found that 30 to 40% of these patients' bladder and bowel dysfunction improved. So I don't think we can look at everybody exactly the same. Uh, and I would just kind of keep that in, in the back of your minds that that reflux may actually be contributing to some of these problems. Although I would, I would agree that this would be a rare event. Tony, anything to add? Um, my only comment to, uh, to Andy regarding that is that I, I agree that there, there were studies that suggested that BUR may be contributing to dysfunction, but it was awfully hard to sort out those where it was the reflux alone or maybe the recurring urinary tract infections that these child had that caused their bladder dysfunction, they have associated reflux as well. So I'm not quite sure that it's a clear association, um, but it's something that we should keep in the back, to the back of our minds. I think another point that's important yeah. too, that, uh, uh, actually Darius just uh, asked me about is, uh, what do we tell them about pregnancy now? So this is a girl who's unlikely to outgrow her reflux because of its bilateral, bilaterality uh, and the fact that it's grade three. But, and uh, we used to say, gee, we need to fix these because of the risk during pregnancy. We no longer uh, say that. We don't think that the risk is that much greater. The risk is if there is renal insufficiency. So it's actually the creatinine level or creatinine clearance, not the reflux that's the issue that goes on. That's right. It's usually bilateral renal scarring that is the biggest risk factor. Yes. yes. Okay, so moving forward, this patient had endoscopic correction. Uh, this is an ultrasound post. This is a VCUG post. As you can see, there's no more reflux. Uh, She's been just in follow-up. So the question is uh, to uh, Tony, What's the need for VCG at later age? Because she's eight, people uh, or some uh, approach uh, this differently at age of 13, 14, they would have repeated the VCG. Would you repeat her VCG at any point? I would only repeat her VCG if she presented with uh, recurring upper tract infections. Um, durability of deflux is not 100%. We certainly know that from Andy's data, we know that from Prim Puri's data, we know that from data. Somewhere between 10 to 20 percent would recur with reflux. But if it's completely asymptomatic and not causing uh, upper tract infections, I would not see any need to repeat a VCG unless I'm performing a study for a new technique for deflux correction or something along those lines. Andy, can you uh, share with us your experience about the deflux? Do we have enough data about the long-term uh, uh, outcomes of deflux for this patient? Yeah, no, we have now 25-year uh, follow-up data. Joran Lachrin uh, has a publication that's in press now uh, looking at it. Uh, our, our group at Atlanta now has almost 20-year data um, looking at this. So we know that the, the clinical success rate is, is excellent. Um, the ability to prevent another febrile UTI um, is as good as open surgery. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, do you need to check because of some, there are definitely reports of recurrence, um, but recurrence in, in the absence of a clinical indication, uh, in other words, getting a VCG routinely, um, I don't think is supported by the clinical data. Um, you know, even in the Swedish reflux trial, where the success rate was between 60 and 70% in patients with high-grade reflux treated with deflux, uh, they show that the UTI rate was pretty low. So there may be a role even just for downgrading reflux, um, showing good clinical long-term success. So I would agree in the absence of a clinical indication, I don't see a reason to do another VCUG on, on this patient. I do, however, follow them with ultrasound. And I think it's reasonable to have at least one ultrasound one year later, showing that you don't have hydronephrosis that you haven't seen previously. Great. Marty, anything to add? Not really, I, I agree with the panelists. Great, any, uh, Mustafa, any questions from the audience? 
Yeah, there was uh, one question. There are several questions. One of them is from uh, Darius, and uh, I think uh, Marty answered that regarding the reflux versus pregnancy issue, and uh, you mentioned this, Marty, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So um, the the uh, other question is, um, what to do if the child has a both high both void residual, but he is he or she is still symptomatic. Would you consider this as, would, would this probably change the risk criteria for infection or something? So I think the key again, as we talked about is, women tend to have increased incidence of uh, urinary tract infections with age. So at any age, I told them that a happy bladder is an empty bladder, an even happier bladder is an empty rectum. So very good emptying on both sides of the perineum are important in this situation as lifelong hygiene. Okay, Tony. Yeah, I would I would certainly agree with that. I mean, I'd be um, I'd be apt to evaluate that lower tract function maybe with a Euroflow EMG, maybe with a KUB to check for constipation as well, and be certain that that child is emptying as effectively as they possibly can, he or she possibly can. Uh, Andy, your last comment. <laughs> your comment on if patient has a high both volt residual or something, would, would you change your management plan? Um, yeah, again, I think um, in the absence of infection, I, it wouldn't change my, uh, my um, threshold for intervention. That just means I would work harder on better bowel and bladder habits, as mentioned by the other panelists. Okay. Um, uh, question is, uh, uh, yeah, in case you decided to do reimplantation in a case, in a case of decreasing grade of reflux, but the uh, Deflux is decreasing. I don't know it. what does this mean. Uh, how would you guarantee for no more decrease in the deflux of the affected site? I don't know. Differential function, sorry. This is probably related to the previous uh, case, isn't it? I don't know. I think, I think some of the questions are not clear, so... We'll try to, I'll try to summarize them and put them probably at the end of the third case. And for the you sake of time, uh, let's most of all move to the next case. Can you share your screen, please? Uh, how can I share my screen? Huh? I need to... Okay. Yeah, I am trying. Uh, yeah, yeah. I cannot do it. You, you need to. Yeah. Hmm. I'll do it from my side. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay do you hear me? Okay. So, uh, can you hear me, guys? Yes. I don't know what happened to my connection now. <laughs> can you see the screen? Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Mustafa. Mustafa? Yes. You, you, you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, the, this is uh, uh, the third case is uh, at, I don't know. I, I should.
Okay. Go ahead. I so can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So our third case is um, a 12 years old boy. Uh, he presented at the age of 10 years with one episode of uh, hematuria, um, probably secondary to trivial trauma during soccer game. Uh, he presented a few weeks later to the urology for evaluation. He had no documented UTIs. He had no voiding symptoms, uh, no voiding dysfunction symptoms, no constipation, and he has no normal uh, and normal renal functions. This is his ultrasound showing uh, a mild uh, or grade one hydro on the right side and uh, grade three to four hydro on the left side with possible uh, duplication. And his blood review showed dilated uh, both ureters. Okay. Um, VCUG uh, was planned and it was done showing grade uh, three to four high, uh, BUR on the right side and uh, complete duplication on the left side with grade five BUR on the lower moiety and probably grade three uh, on the uh, upper moiety. Uh, normal bladder and normal uh, voiding, uh, normal uh, urethra on voiding cell. So, uh, yeah. So, a DMSA showed uh, almost, uh, it's not, a, uh, it's a, around 3% uh, function on the left side. It's almost non functioning left kidney with a normal uh, right kidney. So uh, he was uh, on follow-up, he, he, he was given on follow-up and he, he presented for follow-up. He was continent day and night. Uh, there was no uh, UTI, he was not on cap. His blood pressure was normal and his uh, renal function was normal. Serum creatinine was 63 micromole per liter. And this is his uh, follow-up ultrasound showing almost the same uh, finding as before. So, uh, Several, uh, shall we go to the pool, Fahad? Yeah, we'll go to the pool first. Yeah. So in summary, this is a 12 years old boy, asymptomatic bilateral high grade VUR, and uh, poorly or non-functioning left kidney. What would be your preferred approach? We'll wait for one minute and then. Okay, we're at the one minute mark, so uh, we have 74% on the third. Uh, can you all see the result, Mustafa? Yes, uh, surprising, huh? The result. <laughs> okay, so uh, to start with, um, so this patient presented with only one episode of a gross hematuria, and his ultrasound was showing this uh, degree of hydrocrosis on the left side. The first question uh, to the panelists was uh, having a VCUG was really the right uh, things to do after this scenario um, with presence of possible duplication on the left side. So, um, yeah, so, uh, Marty, yes, please. So again, this was a previously asymptomatic boy who never had a urinary tract infection. It would have been very interesting to know if there were antenatal ultrasounds uh, to see what it looked like. But I think the key is there's no cancer, there's no stone, which is the most important thing to exclude. Uh, Tony, you may want to comment on this, but you wrote a paper years ago about urethrorasia and catheterizing and doing cystoscopy on these boys and the risk of stricture later on. 
So I tend not to, uh, the, the thing I care about most in this case is obstruction, not reflux. And I pr likely would have been more concerned about the lower pole on the left and done a MAG3 scan. But so I would not have done a BCOG with a normal ultrasound of the bladder in this case. And I'm just wondering, uh, Tony's thoughts about urethroration and making sure proper questions are uh, asked and answered. Well, my, my feeling, Marty, would be uh, you can usually elicit a pretty good history that's considered with, consistent with urethrasia, and that is a terminal hematuria or blood spotting afterwards. And if that was a scenario, I probably would try and avoid any catheterization or manipulation of this boy's urethra and proceed as you would, you, as you have suggested, to upper tract evaluation for both function or obstruction. Um, but this was probably gross hematuria based on some mild trauma with an abnormal kidney is what I'm thinking this likely was. And uh, based on the ultrasound that was done, I think it was appropriate to do the ultrasound, of course. And based on that ultrasound, if I was sure it was not urethrasia, I would have gone ahead with a BCUG. And I would, um, uh, I would have um, advocated that this, this child have a VCG based on that ultrasound, yes. Andy? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I would agree also um, that the first thing I would be thinking about is, uh, is uh, distal ureteral obstruction or even, or even ectopic ureter uh, to some degree. If you look at the ultrasound in this patient, you could see the ureter going almost lateral to the rectum. Um, and so that would be one, one concern. Uh, the other is um, if you did a MAG3 first and you saw that there was poor function uh, and um, you know, it may show that you have poor drainage and that might be based on function alone and, and it may not help you uh, that much um, and it may lead to getting a VCUG. So you know, the question now um, I think one of the questions missing from your survey, of course, was the operation that maybe saw other people considered and didn't see it as a choice, and that would be to do a nephrectomy, uh, because this kid has had, now has at least signs and maybe symptoms uh, of obstruction or reflux, and that's hematuria. Um, they're at the age where they're going to be at increasing risk for proteinuria and for hypertension. So you do have the option of observation with close follow-up. I think it, you know, getting back to what Tony started the conversation with uh, about compliance, you know, again, if you have a poorly compliant family, this may be a good case for doing a nephrectomy. Um, and then the question is, what do you do about the other side? Um, so this may be a combination answer of different treatments, but I would consider doing a laparoscopic or robotic nephrectomy um, and then doing a contralateral deflux injection on the right side. Okay. Uh, Marty, uh, going back to your comment on um, your, um, um, you were worried about destruction more than reflux, but would you do like a, a, a nuclear function test without having a, a, a VCUG knowing that reflux might uh, interfere with the results of uh, your uh, functional study? Mustafa, this is a 12-year-old, so he can voluntarily void, and you can ask him on the table to empty his bladder if you're concerned about the bladder being full or whatever uh, in that situation. So unlike a baby, you don't have the same concerns. Okay. Marty, would you consider doing a delayed nuclear study? Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I would say that no, if you do the nuclear study only, but I, I would consider if you're doing a BCG, and as a first test, that you always get delayed films if you're concerned about uh, obstruction to make sure that the system's drained. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, Andy, in your institution where you really did pioneer work with the MR, would you have done an MR as your first test in this patient? Yeah, I think in a case like this, I probably would have done an MR urogram uh, because it is, uh, especially with kidneys that are are more abnormal. I think there's a lot of error um, with the MAG3 scan. In fact, that 7% that may be overestimated. But when you look at the ultrasound, you know, if you told me that was a 20% kidney, I probably would say, yeah, it's possible. The problem with nuclear medicine studies is they, they take into consideration 
dysplastic as well as normally functioning tissue and pool it and give you a volumetric function. With an MRU, it'll only look at uh, tissue that has function. And so you'll get a more accurate um, assessment of kidney function. In this case, you know, does it matter if it's 15% uh, or 5%? Probably not. Um, but I think, you know, re-implanting this ureter uh, is probably not the right answer. And so you're either going to do nothing or observe this patient in the absence of symptoms. But I, I, again, I would say this is a, a higher risk patient because at age 12, they've already shown possibly that minimal trauma could lead to some hematuria um, and they have their whole life to have bigger problems. Uh, this probably uh, raised the question of uh, what is the cutoff point of uh, renal function that you would probably save that kidney versus removing that kidney. And this is probably a debatable also, whether it is 10%, 15%, 5%. <laughs> so, um, uh, Tony, can you have a comment on this? Well, Mustafa, I think that's an excellent question, but, but I think it also depends on what the pathology is. If you're dealing with a 10% functioning kidney, in the face of obstruction, it's probably something that I would consider salvaging. If you're dealing with a 10% kidney in the face of reflux where there's normal function on the other side, I think it's debatable because I don't think you're gonna see any recoverability of function if you correct the reflux. Whereas with obstruction, you have some potential depending on the age of the child, of course, the degree of obstruction, you have some potential for recoverability of function. Uh, on correction of the obstruction. Uh, Marty, do you have a cutoff point for like treating, let us say, um, reflux patients that you intended to either operate, either reimplant or remove? Do you have a cutoff point of renal function? No, it's not the renal function as much as it is the associated symptoms. So if this were recurrent febrile UTIs uh, or let's say there was hypertension or some degree of proteinuria, then I would likely remove the less than 10% uh, functioning kidney at this age group. Do I know the recoverability of this as a six month old as opposed to a 12 month old? The answer is probably not gonna get better, but it's, I'm more likely in that age group to, get, to do a re-implant and then remove the kidney if I need to at a later date. But, at this age group, I think that the, the uh, horse is out of the barn, so to speak. And uh, uh, if there were other issues, recurrent febrile UTIs, a high-grade proteinuria, especially with hypertension, that would be my indication for nephrectomy. Andy? Yeah, and one, one nice thing about the MRU is that um, it gives you a lot more physiologic data about renal function. Uh, it also tells you which kidneys have uh, the ability to improve after release of the obstruction. And that's something called the asymmetry index. Um, it's very unlikely after age two, just historically, that you're going to have recoverable kidney function. Um, with that said, if this was a case with renal insufficiency, I would keep 10% in. I wouldn't be taking that kidney out. Um, but it would, in the face of having a normal contralateral kidney, um, my threshold for nephrectomy at 7% um, would be uh, way, way lower. Okay. Uh, so uh, what would be your uh, management plan? Uh, would there either observation, endoscopy correction, ureteric implantation, Tony? So with a single episode of hematuria, um, I probably would observe this child unless the family were uncomfortable with that. If he were to have another episode or other symptomatology that both Marty and Andy have mentioned, then my vote would be for a left nephrourethectomy and correction of the reflux at the right side at that time. I'd probably feel uncomfortable with just a left nephrourethectomy alone, only because I would suspect that that will increase the risk to the right kidney with the pop-off mechanism on the left side gone. So it would either be observe this child or proceed with the left nephrourethectomy and correction of the reflux at the right, on the right side at that time. If I Marty. Make, yeah, okay. yeah, sure, Andy. If I could just make a quick comment. So 
Um, I, I would look at this the same way. The only difference is that when we did unilateral deflux injection in patients with unilateral reflux, um, the incidence of pop-off was about 15%. Historically, it's, I think John Woodard published something like 20%. It's, it's a real entity, but I think you could predict which ones could pop off by looking at the hydrodistension grade of the, nor of the contralateral ureter. So if I hydrodistended the right ureter here and it didn't open at all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, do a deflux injection. I would observe it. Okay, I'm, I'm with Tony. If the patient had febrile urinary tract infection, so again, uh, I would, and I was doing a, 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 a laparoscopic uh, mm -hmm. uh, nephrourethectomy. I would either, if I was as skilled as Fahad is, I, I probably through the laparoscope would do the re-implant extravesically on the right side. But given that I'm not as good as he is, I'm an old guy and I'm much better with deflux, I would likely deflux the other side. Uh, uh, is there any um, I mean, risk of poor bladder function at this age from like this high grade reflux on both sides? Um, he is now 12 years. So I worry more about the... I more, worry more about the younger patients. Uh, uh, we had a series that we published uh, along with Graham Smith, uh, Jack Elder, and uh, Jerry Mingan, where we had boys uh, who had unilateral um, extravesical reimplants, either open or robotically, or transvesical, intravesical uh, uh, intra reimplants. So not, not bilateral uh, extravesical reimplants who went into urinary retention for periods uh, of longer than three months. So there, I had a, I have a, and uh, five out of the six patients were boys. So I have a, a great worry about boys in particular with big ureters with high grade reflux and reimplanting them early, even though uh, the, um, the, the group from the Netherlands has shown uh, that that doesn't seem to be the case with their mega ureters that they re-implanted early. Okay. Yeah, uh, that, that, yeah last, last uh, uh, question is, would you consider like doing endoscopic um, management for both sides without removing that uh, non-functioning kidney? I know, I know that, uh, Sick kids, they do uh, for for uh, some non-functioning kidney urethral clipping or something. So, would you consider uh, occluding that uh, reflux, uh, refluxing non-functioning kidney instead of removing that kidney? So, I, I would I would not be in favor of that personally. So, I, I tend to be the older of the two of us who are clippers here at uh, uh, Sick Kids, and I think I'm I've had too many complications in my life. So I tend not to clip if there's any function whatsoever. Um, uh, so I'm not as aggressive about it. Andy, would you, would you consider endoscopic? Uh... Yeah, I, I would consider it. Um, you know, the question is, is, is deflux effective in grade five reflux? And, and yeah, I think it's, uh, if you look at it like it's 50-50, uh, it is effective. Um, but if you look at it, like, is it 95% successful? Probably not. Um, if you're doing this versus observation and you're going to um, consider deflux on the other side, I would consider both sides. You know, the, the, when you look at this VCUG, you, you called it a complete duplication previously. Um, it's, it's very likely that, that there's one ureteral orifice in the bladder. It's refluxing into both ureters pretty equally. And so I wouldn't look at this as, as the success of doing a duplex injection where the success rate in my hands is about 80%, not 90 something percent, um, it would probably have the same success rate as doing a single system. And uh, I would again, look at hydrodistension. If, if I looked in the bladder and I saw that uh, this was a big gaping ureteral orifice, it's gonna require more deflux to get it to close. The success rate may be the same as the other side. If I looked in and I saw that um, this was actually a, almost a normal appearing ureter. Uh, the ureteral orifice was close to being normal. That would concern me. That would mean, to me, that would mean that this is a combination of a UVJ obstruction and reflux. And had I done surgery or done deflux, I would be concerned about obstructing this kidney. 
And so those are the, those are the things I would consider at the time of considering deflux injection. Okay, uh, Fahad, we'll move to the question. Uh, I can't see them from my end, Mustafa, because I'm sharing the screen. So can you look through them? Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, question, probably this is a general question. Um, do you consider the same approach for high-grade reflux in a uh, single kidney um, uh, in asymptomatic patients? I mean, as compared to reflux in both uh, sides. Single, I'm sorry, is the question single kidney function or single ureteral orifice? Said, do you consider the same approach for high grade VUR in single kidney? I mean, solitary kidney. Yeah. So the consequences yeah. now are much higher, right? If you, get, yeah. if you get an obstruction from your intervention in an asymptomatic patient with high grade reflux, and you go from obstruct, you go from reflux to obstruction. To now you've bought a much much bigger problem than you had pre-op. Uh, so that would be the main consideration here. Um, and I would be very hesitant to, to intervene on an asymptomatic patient with single kidney function. No, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, is there a, a rule for urodynamic study in this patient? Marty? I don't, I don't see an indication, and I think urodynamics in the face of high-grade reflux is very difficult to perform uh, unless you have very specific questions, and uh, especially related to emptying. But pressures are very hard to determine. Can we leave the rest of the question to the end for the sake of time? What's that? Yeah, sure. uh, we'll move to the next case. We'll leave time for the questions at the end. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, last case uh, is a newborn baby. Uh, he had antenatal uh, bilateral hydronephrosis that was confirmed uh, postnatally. Uh, this is his uh, initial postnatal ultrasound, which showed uh, a grade uh, four right hydronephrosis and uh, minimal or no hydronephrosis on the left side, which could have probably be done very early uh, postnatally and a dilated uh, ure right uh, ureter. Uh, this is his uh, voiding cyst urethrogram, uh, showing a grade five uh, right basic ureter reflux. And the left side is not clear, maybe in the other uh, picture, Fahad. No, sorry. So uh, there is another picture was showing a bilateral high grade reflux, probably on the left side is a grade uh, four uh, VUR and uh, grade five uh, VUR. So he had normal renal function. He was discharged on uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, so um, again, back to the, our question. Um, would you consider uh, on a discharge plan either circumcision versus cab or both? Uh, Tony. So I would advocate for circumcision in this child, but um, it wouldn't change whether I put him on prophylaxis or not. I think circumcision will reduce his risk of urinary tract infections, but it wouldn't reduce my tendency to put him on prophylaxis anyway. So if the family decides for cultural reasons, they're more comfortable without him being circumcised, I would still keep him on antibiotic prophylaxis and, and, and watch him either way. So you, you, you prefer both? Correct. Okay, uh, Marty. So uh, again, in the first year of life is when boys who are uncircumcised are mo most prone to urinary tract infections. So uh, I do suggest circumcision. And just like Tony, this patient would be placed on antibiotics for the first year of life. And Andy? I would agree with both. Okay. So which, which uh, Andy, which risk group you would place this patient? Well, the high risk. Having this DMSA. Yeah. Um, you have a DMSA? So, it, so yeah. DMSA is, is showing uh, a, a normal left kidney with uh, reduced function on the uh, right side is 37% with uh, evidence of uh, photobinic areas 
um, indicating uh, the presence of dysplasia. Right. So, you know, in looking at that ultrasound that you showed initially, the, I think there's some peripheral cysts in that one also. Um, if you look at the VCUG, um, you can see a, one peripheral cyst may be correct. And then if you go to the next slide, um, this is not only a, a dysplastic kidney, but it's really a dysplastic ureter. You know, it's, 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 it's na narrow in many places. It's bigger in other places. It probably has hypocaristalsis. Um, so, you know, I'd be concerned about doing anything surgically to that patient in the absence of uh, um, any type of infections. Um, we do see that this, ba this baby could empty their bladder completely on the VCUG, but leaves behind a dilated ureter on, the, on that last VCUG you showed. Um, yeah. you know, that, some people consider that a risk factor that you're not emptying your upper tract. There is a Korean study that showed that boys with high grade reflux in the first year of life with failure to empty their upper tracts on a VCUG or at higher risk. We repeated that same study uh, in over 100 patients. We found that as long as they're on antibiotic prophylaxis, it didn't increase their risk for a breakthrough infection compared to the ones that did empty their upper tracts. Um, so I would observe this patient repeat their studies in a year. Okay. Uh, Marty. Would you um, put him on a high risk group or a low risk group? Well, I certainly with any um, uh, alteration in renal function, uh, I put him in a higher risk group. But if uh, the, the important thing is we don't do true creatinine clearance in these kids. So we don't know what their true renal function is. So we rely on creatinine as being a surrogate and the absence of proteinuria but anytime I see asymmetry of function, uh, I put them into a higher risk group. Uh, Tony? Yeah, I think the fact that we're looking at a significant amount of dysplasia in that right kidney, and I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite convinced that the left kidney is normal either, quite honestly, but we'll see. Um, I would place this child in a high risk group and that would push me towards antibiotic prophylaxis. Not, not, a, not an option. Uh, they, he definitely would go on antibiotic prophylaxis. That would be my recommendation. Okay, so uh, he, he presented for follow-up at the age of six months. He was still asymptomatic, uh, no breakthrough urinary tract infection. He was still on cap. This is his ultrasound, uh, the right kidney and the left kidney. The left kidney now hydro becomes more prominent and bladder is uh, as shown before. So he was uh, advised to continue and follow up uh, with the same plan. Uh, and this is his, uh, he was continued on cap for the, uh, until the age of two years. Uh, this is his ultrasound showing a more dilated right kidney, uh, almost a normal left kidney and uh, a normal bladder. So, uh, and this is his uh, follow-up voiding cyst urethrogram, uh, showing uh, stem uh, grade four to five high, uh, sorry, right BUR, um, almost a normal bladder, and a still a persistent, um, also left uh, grade uh, four BUR. This is his repeated DMC, um, showing uh, more reduction in the uh, right kidney function from 37 to 23% with more uh, photobenic areas uh, and uh, an abnormal left kidney, but it's still uh, contributing to 77% of the uh, better than the uh, right side. So uh, we will uh, move to, to the pool and then we will start discussing uh, this case.
for people still voting. We have 69% voted already. We just wait for the one minute mark and stop it. Okay. Can you see the result, Mustafa? Yeah, so so um, so the majority will go for uh, surgical intervention, and it is equally half. Uh, half will go for endoscopic, and half will go for urethral implantation. Okay, that's the question. Imahid. <laughs> so so. Um, uh, the question is uh, before the before the uh, approach is is um, when you have a patient with high grade reflux and you place him on antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, what will, what would be the the preferred time to repeat his avoiding uh Is it one year, um, eighteen months, two years? So what, um, uh, Tony? What is your uh, follow up plan for those patients? I don't know that there's any um, cookbook that you need to that you can follow on this, but I'd be inclined to repeat his VCUG uh, eight, at 18 to 24 months of age, probably closer to 24 months of age, to get a new baseline as to where we are with this child, because you're going to be at a decision point as to whether you're going to do something for him or not. And I would like to have the latest information on an ultrasound and the VCUG at that time. I probably would consider stopping his prophylaxis um after toilet training but we'll get to that in just a second sorry i just got ahead of myself a little bit okay so marty uh would you uh do it at one year or uh, two years so you're gonna think that i'm a reflux nihilist but again i would have or and probably darius would as well at one year stop the prophylaxis assuming the ultrasound showed what it did in your case uh, uh, and only repeated a VCUG uh, if there were infections afterwards. So we would not have repeated the VCUG. Okay, Andy. Yeah, I would have. I would have uh, looked at the VCUG to see when the reflux occurred. If it was low volume, low pressure reflux, which is associated with higher risk of infection, a lower chance of resolution. Um, I would certainly repeat the VCUG at a year. I would expect it not to change that much if that were the case. Um, and then you, you, know, you asked about whether I put this into a high risk or a lower risk category at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what that means because are they high risk of getting an infection or are they a high risk of non-resolution or a high risk of both? Um, and I would say- high, that, high risk of both. Okay, so I'd say this is probably a very high risk of non-resolution and probably a low, a very low risk of having a clinical problem that we could fix. Uh, so, you know, this patient has renal dysplasia. It's not surprising the differential renal function uh, favored the left kidney, which is growing at a faster rate than the right kidney. And that's why it looks like it dropped in function. But in the absence of infection, it's unlikely that this was an acquired injury to that kidney. It just kind of stopped growing at the same, same rate. And in 10 years, I'd expect that kidney function to be less than it is now. Um, it probably wouldn't change what I would recommend. So I probably would stop getting DMSAs, um, you know, in the absence of a, a reason to look uh, for, for the function and because of a clinical issue. Uh, but I certainly would do an ultrasound and a VCUG uh, about a year later. So, so uh, how can you um, explain the drop in um, the renal function or let us say, uh, increase in the photobinic area, given the fact that, you know, some children, uh, they might present with febrile episode uh, to the primary uh, physician and being treated for like upper tract infection, respiratory tract infection, although they might have uh, a, a, a urinary tract infection rather. So uh, um, how can we uh, sure that this drop in function is uh, of, in, of function is secondary to the increase in the function on the contralateral kidney rather than a true um, scarring or reduced function? So the truth uh, is, you, you yeah. So Andy, yeah, I'm sorry. The truth, the truth is, you can't tell by looking at a DMSA scan. Um, you have to go by the history. 
So if you're saying this is, this is a patient who's not had a urinary tract infection, um, and this is what you're showing us over, over a year or two. Um, so in this case, I would say it has to be dysplasia. If you told me that the patient was seeing their pediatrician for recurrent UTIs, I would say, well, it's either acquired or dysplasia or both. Um, again, getting back to the MRU, the MRU, there are different signs that you could look at that distinguish dysplasia um, from uh, acquired injury. Um, and so, um, you know, not everybody has the ability to look at those films. Um, so, you know, in this case, a static DMSA scan is not helpful in, dis in, as in answering your question. Marty. So, I think it's... You know, Sorry, what were you saying? I'm saying, I mean, a lot of children, they present with febrile episodes. And um, unfortunately, some of the primary care physician or their family physician just prescribed them antibiotics to be like labeling them as upper tract, upper respiratory tract infection. And they probably had truly uh, 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 a urinary tract infection. So Mustafa, I, I'm very, very uh, emphatic about how a urinary tract infection needs to be diagnosed properly in a patient uh, below potty training. And, to, and unless you get a good specimen with a urinalysis showing uh, uh, leukocytes and uh, significant factor urea with a single organism growing, I don't like the patients to get labeled because it's exactly what you said. It puts the patient as a labeled patient, not necessarily something with a confirmed diagnosis. And unfortunately, when, that, when the label gets transmitted to the family and to the child and they come to your office, you don't want to make the other doctor look wrong, but you also don't want the family to make a choice on treatment based on inaccuracies. So it, it becomes a real conflict when you see those patients in your office. Um, so again, I go over the results in detail and I go nuts if I see uh, uh, the patient treated and labeled without proper documentation. Uh, so uh, Tony, um, um, do you have any other comments than uh, Marty and Andy? No, okay. I, I totally agree that the DMSA scan is not going to tell you whether these this is acquired change or just natural growth of, of, of two abnormal kidneys. The fact that this child does have two abnormal kidneys, whether it's dysplasia or acquired scarring, clearly places them in a high-risk group in my mind, though. So one of the well, points uh, I want yeah. to make, again, as Tony was saying, that if you're born with a bad leg, okay, and you fracture that leg, it's likely going to have a worse outcome than someone who had a normal leg to begin with. So when you have a reduced nephron complement or something that's been uh, 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 scarred to begin with, for lack of a better term, dysplastic in this case, there's not enough reserve. And that's why I think we can't look at high-grade reflux the same way as we do at lesser degrees where there's normal kidneys on top. And Tony brought it up, it could be one to five with a normal DMSA scan. But if we see an abnormal DMSA scan, it's a different population because those are broken kidneys to begin with. So, uh, Ma, I think uh, because of the time, we are all, almost now uh, one and a half hours since we started. So, um, the last uh, point with is the timing of reflux relevance in managing children. I think uh, uh, Andy has an, uh, an, uh, a comment and slide to comment on that. Uh, can you share the slides, Fahad? You are muted, Fahad. So you can, you can advance the slides for me. That would be terrific. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mustafa. Just before we move forward, so we... Uh, we, uh, we see and read in the literature about the timing of reflux, low pressure, high pressure, low volume, high, vo uh, high volume. Question to Andy. Uh, usually the patient comes already with VCG done. Uh, so are you there with your radiologist at the time of the study? Uh, 
uh, one. Two, how do you use this data in a clinical setting, not research, not academic? How do you use this clinical data to uh, make your uh, choices and uh, judgment for uh, each cases? So I think, thankfully, uh, uh, Andy shared with us his slides. Uh, so you want to use the slides first or you want to comment? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and go to the first slide there. Yeah, so we've been talking about timing of reflux on a BCUG and other predictors of, of non-resolution. And the, we developed uh, something called the VOR index. And this is based on the first BCUG. Um, and it's in patients with febrile UTI that are less than age two. So important to the group of patients we talked about today. So if you just look at the first question of anomalies, the chance for resolution is a lot higher if you have no anomalies. Anomalies being a duplicated system, complete duplication, or periureal diverticuli. If you look at grade, uh, low grade uh, have a much higher resolution than high grade reflux. And then finally, if you look at timing of reflux on a VCUG, early filling reflux has a very, very low chance of resolving despite the grade of reflux. Okay, so if you look at our data, and, and we did this together with Chris Cooper in Iowa, with Angie Arlen at Yale, um, Mike Garcia in my group, um, for several years, and we pulled all of our, all of our, all of our data. And this, this score basically is based on, on four things. It's based on timing. Early filling is low pressure and low volume reflux. You get three points against you. If you have anomalies, you get one point against you. If you have high grade reflux, you get a point. And then if you're a girl, you get a point against you because boys tend to resolve faster than girls. And the, so the score is one to six. So here's an example of a girl that presented with a febrile UTI that has early filling left-sided high grade reflux, intravenal reflux. So her score would be, three for early filling, zero for the presence of anomalies, one for having high grade, one for being a girl. She gets a score of five over six, okay? If you go to the next slide, you can see, if you look at the far right, her chance of resolving her reflux or improving significantly over two years is only 8%. If you have an index of three, which means all you need is early filling reflux, your chance is already below 50%. Uh, and I would consider that a high risk patient. Um, and if there's another slide or not on here. Um, and then if you look at resolution over time, based on your score, you could see that the higher your index, the lower your resolution. This was based on uh, our 222 patients. We added to that a validation group in Iowa um, with Chris Cooper and Angie Arlen. Um, and then we have almost 600 patients in kids less than two. If you go to the last slide, you can see we repeated this in kids over age two in the blue, and it basically gives us the same, the same thing. Um, what I'm not showing you here is the um, UTI data that we just got published. Uh, it basically shows if you have early filling reflux and higher uh, VOR index, your chance for infection is a lot higher than if you had a lower index. Um, and that's uh, recently published as well. Um, so I use this every time I see a patient with reflux. Your question is, am I there with the, with the radiologist? Actually not. So you have to retrain your, your radiologist to indicate, does this reflux happen early in the bladder cycle or not? It's very hard to look at static films, not knowing when they were done, to know if it's early filling or late filling or voiding. But I can tell you, there's a huge difference between early filling reflux and voiding reflux. Voiding reflux happens only in grades one and two and 5% of patients with grade three, uh, whereas early filling reflux happens at all grades of reflux, but most, most importantly, it happens more likely in grade four and five. Great, thank you. Uh, just. Tony, question. Uh, Sometimes we have patients that comes comes to us like this case, uh, seeing the nephrologist, the neurologist scared, the shade of them that the function is reducing, and the surgeon have to intervene. Uh, so in this case, you have a patient that comes already with the mindset of surgery, and uh, if if we know that we agreed that this patient might not need intervention, how do you help? Uh, how do you counsel those parents, especially if they're parents that you trust? 
trust them that they come for follow up and they have a good GP. So how do you counsel those parents? Well, you know, I think that's a tough situation because sometimes you're dealt with the cards that the nephrologist has laid down for you. And it puts you between a, hard, a rock and a hard place. Because what you have to tell the parents is that you can correct the reflux, but there is some risk associated with it, especially the higher the grade of reflux. But if a child has never had urinary tract infections to begin with, I'm not so sure I'm gonna do your child a favor by correcting the reflux necessarily. So it's a hard discussion, it's a long discussion, and um, it's not someone you're gonna get in and out of your office in 10 minutes, I guarantee it. Because you're really put into a tough, a tough situation if you've been set up to correct this reflux. And this, this happens uh, not infrequently, shall we say. And for fairness, nephrologist does the creatinine clearance and they do like, as Margie said earlier, they have numbers. We usually deal with imaging, but they do have different uh, parameters they use for function. I think we're not seeing this part of the picture, and this is the importance of having good connection between pediatric urologist and nephrologist. Uh, last question to Marty. Someone mentioned from the audience about is there a, a query uh, UBJ on the right side in this patient? So uh, it's very unlikely in, in this case, but you have the benefit of having done a retrograde polygram for a for lack of a better uh, uh, definition, by having a good cystogram. And what you do is get delayed post-void films to see how quickly uh, that right side uh, drains. This does not look to me like a coincidental or a secondary uh, uh, UPJ. So I would not go ahead with a MAG-3 Lasix in this situation. The, the, other, the other point, Marty, um, is that if you see the early films, and you see a discrepancy in terms of the density of the contrast in the ureter versus the density of the contrast in the renal pelvis, then you were more worried about a secondary or primary UPG obstruction as well. So if you're seeing both the early films as well as the late film, should be able to sort that out. Uh, it usually looks diluted, so it shows that it's not getting in properly. So uh, this is it for the cases. Just to uh, mention the paper, I. Uh, mentioned earlier that Marty shared with us. I think it's worth reading. Uh, before we conclude, uh, last comment for uh, each panelist. Do we understand VUR better? Is it still the prostate cancer of pediatric urology? Uh, we'll start with Andy. Yeah, I was gonna make that comment. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you did. Um, yeah, first of all, I wanna thank you, Fahad and Mustafa for inviting me and the other panelists. This was a great opportunity. Um, to discuss something that, you know, each of us have spent our careers looking at. So thank you very much. Um, I think with all the guidelines that have come around over the years, um, we uh, are learning more about reflux. I think our referring uh, doctors are a little less clear about what to do about reflux. Uh, and it continues to be our responsibility to educate our referring doctors uh, about what we consider to be important reflux. Uh, but there, you know, as, as, as Tony said earlier, grade one and grade two reflux in a lot of ways is more important, more clinically significant than the cases that were presented today. I feel like we could offer those patients something. I think doing a reimplant in an asymptomatic boy with grade five reflux and, and dysplasia, I think I'm offering them the opportunity to become obstructed um, and uh, giving them a problem they didn't have before I touched them. So I would just say tread carefully uh, on those patients that we presented today uh, and informed decision-making uh, with the family is very important. Um, and um, and uh, yes, reflux is important, maybe in some ways less, uh, but I think it's a pendulum. I think we've swung really far to the left. I think we're starting to actually swing back to really pick out the ones that are important. So thank you all very much for inviting me. Great. Marty, uh, do we understand VR better now? So again, Shukran uh, from here, and I also want to thank uh, Dr. Alamari for his technical help uh, to help you and Mustafa with the presentations. Um, you know, the French philosopher Montaigne said something that was echoed by Mary Poppins, and it was said that there are no answers, there's only questions. And we look at reflux as being the foundation of what really led to pediatric urology 
And the only thing we've really answered over the 50 plus years of, of knowledge is that we know we can reduce the incidence of febrile urinary tract infections by corrective uh, 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 anti-reflux procedures. So we do do some good. We still don't know who needs an operation. And as Andy uh, has shown with his pendulum uh, diagrams in the past, is we go all the way from the extreme as everybody needs surgery, and if so, what kind, do we even need to look for reflux at all? So the, the groups I look at that we really have to concentrate are those that have less renal reserve to begin with, and especially the ones who I feel are dysfunctional voiders or uh, uh, bowel bladder dysfunction and have recurrent infections, because I think those are the ones who are at risk of acquired uh, damage to their kidneys. So it may not be the reflux per se, but it's the reflux in the context of other uh, conditions. Great. Thank you, Marty. Tony? Um, most of you have heard me say this many, many times, and that is that when I finished my training, I felt I understood urinary tract infections and reflux in children a lot better than I do now. Well, that's a little bit tongue in cheek, of course, because what we do know now is that it's a lot more complicated than just the grade of reflux. And I think we've learned a lot about risk stratification through Andy's work and other, others as well, that this is a more complex problem than just the grade of reflux, because we used to treat based on the grade of reflux and the grade and the presence or absence of reflux. Whereas I think we're getting much more individualized in our treatment protocols than we used to. And so I do think we know a lot more about reflux than we used to. And it is a lot more complicated problem than we thought it was in the past. And I've often said, reiterated the words of John Woodard, who said the fact that the ureteral reimplantation re was developed so early on in our understanding of reflux probably was a hindrance because we didn't understand as much about the natural history of reflux as we do today because we operated on all of them. So uh, yeah, I do think we've learned a lot and I do think we uh, understand the problem a lot better than we used to. It's just, we have to accept the fact that's a lot more complicated than it used to be. Great. Uh, so we really thank you and we're lucky to have a great uh, panelist and speakers, uh, well-known figures, well-published in Reflux and we, after the session, I can say for sure that we've made the right decision by choosing uh, Marty Coyle, Andrew Kirsch, and Anthony Caldemon because they really added a lot uh, to the discussion. And I think we understand uh, asymptomatic VR better after this session. This will be shared with uh, your permission, uh, saved, and will be in YouTube for those people who were not able to attend. Uh, it was a great discussion. I appreciate your time. And uh, Mustafa, last word. Uh, thank you again uh, for all our uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, thanks to all uh, participants, and uh, we we uh, say to, to them uh, sorry that we uh, we were not able to uh, answer all their their questions. But uh, hopefully that uh, if they go back to the the recorded video on YouTube, they can uh, probably see th their questions have been answered. Uh, again, thanks all the panelists for their uh, time and uh, enjoy your uh, weekend and uh, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Adil, for your thanks support. And, uh, see you bye -bye. soon. Stay bye -bye. safe. Bye bye. Great job. Great job. You're picking the cases as well. Well yeah. done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for our audience, too. Thank you. See you later. Bye.